All right. Catch up. Tim Kang is live. Can you hear me, brother? I can hear you, bro. I can hear you. Oh, man. See, I've been waiting for this conversation for, what, two weeks now. And now we scheduled, and then we had to reschedule just because of the way life is. <laughs> and then we're finally here. And we're finally, just talking yeah, moments yeah. earlier about about stuff that I'm hoping to talk with you about. So there's a lot of things I want to discuss. There's African literature, of course. There's the MFA life. There yep. is travel as an African on the African continent. Like, there's so many things. But before we jump into that, first, I want to first of all say thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you on the platform to talk about this. And I think every single person that I bring here is somebody whose work or whose just person's life inspires me. And it means a lot for you to say yes to come here and have this conversation. So thank you. And second thing is, as a no, young... Bro, thanks for inviting me. You're welcome, brother. As yeah. a young African creative, I would say even Cameroonian creative, you know, there are very few people... There used to be this space of you're either old and dead and you're like a literary uh, behemoth, like a legend, or you're yeah. too young to be recognized anywhere. And there's this middle space, people like you, Mark, Howard, where it's like young, not it's not necessarily upcoming writers. People are proven that they have the talent and the work and they're doing that. And to have somebody like you on the, ch on the channels, it's a lot. So thank you. And for anybody who is watching right now, thank you so much for joining us on the stream. I have Katia Atemken here. We talk about African literature. Uh, the MFA life, the Masters of Fine Arts, and also travel in Africa. And so, Atemke, I don't know if, wait, no, Ketcha is your first name. I keep, Atemke is the last name, yes. Ketcha, mm -hmm. for those who don't know you, who've never seen you, who don't know what you're about, can you just give us a brief summary of your life story up to this particular point? Well, that Ketcha you said is like an size version. My name is Ketcha Atemke. Ketcha. That's like a Bangwa, Bangwa pronunciation. Um, I was born in Kumba. I was born in Kumba, a small town in, in the English speaking region around um, where I grew up. Um, and then secondary school, um, Cedarism College, Frontem, and high school, San Francis College, Kumba, um, where I started uh, writing like seriously with the college magazine, The Beacon. Um, the editor-in-chief, uh, Mr. Mwenkeme Basil Eswa Epa. He was like my first writing mentor. And um, so he was the one who told me, like, he said, uh, when he read my writing, he said, I've taught in the school for 20 years, but I haven't really met someone who, who writes, you know, this way. However, it is still very raw and it's still how old were you at the time? I was, was it 17, 18. I was in high school. So it's, it's still very raw, it's still very crude, uh, you need to hone it. And I want you to to, you know, to work uh, to work with me alongside me with the school magazine, the vegan. And that's how I started writing like sport articles, football articles, basketball articles, um, poetry. Um I, I was I, I think I won like the best poetry award school magazine and then I won a physics essay. No, I was second place in the physics essay writing competition. And I just went on from there. I never stopped writing. I went to University of Boya in Cameroon, um the English speaking university. And um well it was very hectic. It was very hectic. What did you study in the Oh um curriculum studies um stroke power. I had no idea <laughs> Yeah, it was very hectic. So I couldn't write much. You know, it, it was after I graduated uh, uh, in 2010. I just shumengam. You know, there was no job, <laughs> so I so I just um, dived into into writing full time. I, I wrote a horrible ma uh, novel manuscript. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was terrible. And then I got employed. I got employed, you know, at, at the Douala International Airport, working for Swiss Sport, uh, Swiss Sport, um, which is like the well, Campo PLC, which is like the local branch of the uh, is a ground handling company, multinational company called Swiss Sport. So yeah, I was working for the local uh, branch, and that's how I got started. I started working at the airport, and I just kept writing um, on my off days or at night, and um, I started a literary stroke aviation blog, which I just continued to write, and I was just submitting my work to 
all literary magazines all over Africa and just I just kept going on. There's so many rejections at first, but I just, I just kept going on. On the publications started coming, I started uh, attending workshops, and you know, I, I just that's how I just you know went up yeah. from there. Um, so yeah, I think the work of uh, the the writing I did while I was at the airport put me on the pedestal for just you know going forward and forward. That is impressive. <laughs> I was thinking about it the first time that we met and what conversation we had in the discussion I wrote uh, that we had this argument where we talked about Peter Thiel and Elon Musk and Wanji who was first. And I want to ask you a final from was that the first time we were actually talking in a meeting? Because I that's the first memory that I have of our conversation. It was an argument. I don't know how how uh, that kind of relationship starts from an argument <laughs> to get to this particular <laughs> point. That I know we're preparing for Faber Freak where there was something that Faber Freak was doing uh, Adeline yeah, was, um, um, Adeline yeah. Sedek, um, uh, who was a wonderful big sister of ours um, for yeah. the world. Yeah. Oh, your name? I didn't say that Kamga. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> no relation. No relation. No relation. <laughs> and then um, we're working together. But we also met at the at the Bakwa Fiction Workshop in Yaoundé. I don't know if that we met or. I know that's where you met Howard because the first time Howard I was with Howard was the night Howard before. Howard and yeah. Howard yes. and in there. No, I, I think because my in my memory it, it doesn't fail me. I. Remember that I met uh, Howard and Zekashi there, but I know that I met you before. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, us meeting in in Duala, you know, over the the, the argument. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of things have changed since then. And right? Elon like Musk. You, yeah, that's what we met in Duala. Bloggers. And for the record, you are actually almost correct. When I look at, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember you came and told me that. Yeah, you went and like, actually, up on, on you know on Elon Musk walk with people and you're like, um, I think you're right there. I think you're right. It's probably yeah. It's, <laughs> and <laughs> even though I, even when I look about it now, the whole paper may affair, like every single one of them has independently gone and built something here. So it's like maybe there's actually no leaders. Like all of them are just awesome. But that's yeah, that besides awesome. the point. Yeah, and you've you've moved so far from writing in the school magazine and moving to Douala, getting a job in aviation and using your job to write. Like, that's something I'm actually curious to find out. Was it that you were writing before that was still tilted towards airports or the work at the airport influenced it directly to the point where you started an aviation blog? I'm trying to find out if you were already interested in planes before you started writing about, you know, the aviation. Never. I never traveled before. I, I was never interested in planes. Um, You know, I was just writing other stuff. I was writing just different themes, like just different themes, like uh, like my novels, part, part of it was like set, set in, in the village in, in Quantum. So I was just writing like different themes, but I never really thought about writing at the airport. Um, I started working, even when I started working at the airport, um, like three months in, um, a colleague, you know, read, read some of my stories. This is really good. And then he said, why are you writing about the airport? I was like, no. Like, Man, we're in a place. This is like a gold mine for stories. You're meeting passengers who are, you know, like you. You can meet Samuel Eto anytime. You can meet David O. You can meet Whiskey. You can meet CEOs of companies. You can meet from a scuba diver to an archaeologist to like a librarian. And just why are you not just making use of, you know? So I started thinking about. That was that. a friend who told you that. Yeah. I was like, I never thought about that that way. I was like, well, if I'm, this is like a melting pot of people from all nationalities, people from all professions, and people from like just different countries. I met people from like some very, I met people from Tonga, people from Fiji, people Where's from, Tonga? yeah, it's, like, it's crazy, right? <laughs> met people like, a, I don't like from some Asian country where, yeah, met people from St. Lucia, some, little islands and just, I was like, okay. So I started thinking about that in that direction, but not just that, I started having conversations with these people. So when I was walking at the boarding gates, when like, let's say uh, uh, we're waiting for a plane to land and they're at the boarding gate, and let's say all the passengers are in the gate, I would always try conversations with people from like some very obscure places on the earth. Was that the way you were like as a kid? Is it something that you picked up? Because that's something that strikes me to you as an individual, as a writer. It's like 
you have this ability to just go and do things. Like you talk about, you know, getting rejections and still submitting. It's one of those things that I feel like, wait, how, how, do you, how do you get to the point where you're able to strike conversation with people you don't know, submit to magazines that you have never heard about? Like, how do you build that kind of ability? The thing is, I've always been intellectually, like, intellectually curious. I've always wanted to, like, know things um, and just be intellectually curious. I just do discover, just discover things. They just, just try to experiment with different things. I've always been fascinated with knowledge from new angles. And I'm an extrovert. I, uh, so I, uh, if I see I'm someone, uh, yeah, and I'm perceptive. I just see someone and I look at someone like, um, I think I can strike a conversation with this, this man or with this woman. And so I just went down. How, how do you start? Like, I'm, I'm thinking here as a person, the kind of person who just watches, you know, somebody, somebody's watching this video right now is like, well, I don't know how to talk to people. And it's like, describe how you actually start talking to somebody that, you, you know, you just saw on the street. Like, just paint an image of a, a typical day at the airport that you find somebody that you're like, okay, this person might be interesting. What do you do then? That there's, that, that's um actually at the airport. The airport is a melting pot. It's actually easy to talk to, or well, the airport in Douala. It's actually very easy to talk to people there because it's this space, it's this liminal space where people don't stay for long and you're bored and, you know, you just want to check in and go to the boarding gate and stuff. It's it's like you, you can talk to anybody. It's sort of hard to explain. People are more willing to speak to you, especially if you work at the airport and maybe they need a piece of information. When is a plane coming or is a plane is 20 minutes delayed or just, yeah, just anything. And sometimes it just meets you at your, where you're walking. Cause I was at a boarding gate and um, sometimes would uh, one of like, it's because we work in different positions. And one of the things we did is like um, body scan. So you body scan people with like a yeah. metal yeah. or maybe you search your back or something. If you're body scanning someone later, you can just start asking him questions and he will speak. He'll speak with you and yeah, they're willing to, it's not like another passenger, you're someone who's working at the airport and it's very, actually very easy to strike conversations with people at the airport in Wallace. Yeah. 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 yeah, I just people joke about that. And I do that, you know? But I'm not saying, uh, not not all, of, not all of my colleagues could do that. Some were not just interested. And also <laughs> some were just interested in, you know, you can just... The money. <laughs> Give me money and yeah, traveling. If they, if, they, if they want to head the conversation in the area, in the area where they can get some car. But, but I was only really, yeah. like, interested in, in, you know, getting information That's and then how about your commission actually makes fun there. of me all the time it's like that guy i don't know he's going he's always speaking to passengers i don't know what it is <laughs> <laughs> and then you get somebody who's like well bon, he's a writer he's a writer he's looking for inspiration so so um, some people got used to it okay and how did you get used to rejections from submitting to magazines? I think that's an area that you have told me, like, I'm going to get used to it, submit, and just keep submitting. How do you start? How Do, do you remember your first submission to any magazine? Like, is this something I remember? Or do you, do you remember what it was? And how have you been able to submit consistently up to this particular point where you still submit? And you're still submitting up to next month. There's articles you're, you're still writing. Yeah. Um, the submissions, right? Um... When you start, I can't remember the first one. I can't really remember the first one. Um, but it, I think, I think it was in Boya. Um, there was this. It was a local newspaper. It was like it was, it was a Christian newspaper. They gave a prompt about writing a story about. It was like I forgot. But the prompt was about like HIV AIDS and some. It was like some. Yeah. So they gave a prompt, and I, 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 I wrote it. I typed it. Gave it to the manager. He read it, he liked it, he sent it to he said the manager, the big manager, wherever, wherever I think it was in the US or something. Then later I asked him, was like, oh, that project fell apart, sorry, but we really like story and stuff. You know, I think I was like the first one I was in newspaper, I didn't work. How old were you? Uh, I was in UB at the time, I was in US where I was what, like 22, 21. Yeah. And then I submitted um I'd written a bunch of I written a bunch of like really short children's stories and I submitted them to some publisher in Yaoundé. I can't even remember. That was like 10, 11. They never, they were like, yeah, we, yeah, we only received your submission and they never got back to me. I don't know what happened. What was going on in your mind or what goes on in your mind when you actually send a, a piece? Like, what happens for you? 
I just wait and I hope to hear some. At the time, I was like 21. I thought, okay, Baba had told me that I'm talented. I'm going to win every award. <laughs> and it's like, you start using, you know, life starts hitting you in the way. Oh, the, the, the competition fell apart. Oh, oh, I'm going to choose a submission. And you're like, wait, um, things are going the way you imagine. <laughs> and then it's just, you just wait and wait and just wait and just hope. <laughs> I'm That's not very helpful. It's hard. It's hard. I'm, like, I'm I'm thinking about all the people who try, who don't they want to write, they want to submit to magazines. And I mean, I'm talking about them, I'm talking about myself. Because even yeah. when I write on Medium right now and I submit to publications, which is like you just click a button and it's quote unquote free to publish, you still yeah. get rejections like, oh, this story did not fit, you know, like fix this or do that, or we're not going to go with this particular pitch or something. And I'm wondering if you have any tips for people who would want to submit on how to handle that. Okay. Um, well, I'll just complete the story of the, the submissions and then yeah. I'll come to that. Now what happened is over time, and then I I left like I was like okay, these local publications don't work. I'm going to try internationally. One of the first places I tried internationally was the, the price. There's a price in Ghana called the Golden Baba Prize, and I submitted a bunch of stories to them. They're like, okay, we acknowledge receipt. It was like very professional. Oh, we acknowledge receipt of your stories, and then when the shortlist came, they're like, oh, sorry, um, you were not shortlisted. We appreciate the fact that you submitted to us and stuff like that. You know, so I just and then now I'm a very determined person. So in this, this, so I think personality comes into it. I'm a very determined person. When I said, I think one of my my classmates in high school told me that when I, you know, when I I, I you know when I put my heart on something, you know, when I you know put my energy towards something, I don't stop until I achieve it. So I think first personality plays a role, you know. And then I read this I read this book when I was in high school. Um, the magic of thinking big yeah. by uh, yeah, that's a, very, it's a very popular motivational book, you know, and that book really formed me just the magic of thinking big. I just struggled, you know, I think I swallowed that book from that age and never stopped thinking about it. So mm -hmm. I just like struggled to think big all the time and, you know, combine my personal traits of endurance and, you know, falling down, always getting up. So I, I just, you know, it, I whipped it into that. And then I kept submitting, you know, started going internationally. Like there was this prize in London called the Madi Bucha Story Competition. I was just submitting things everywhere. And Brightivism in Uganda. Um, I just, I, I, can't, I can't even remember all those new black markets. Just, yeah, all of those places. Um, yeah, I just kept submitting. Now what happened is over time, you, well, me, over time, I became desensitized to rejections. So, because I just become used to, I, I called it my shock absorber. I was like, okay, my shock absorber is intact. You know, when a rejection come, comes and it comes my way and it falls into my sponge and then I just squeeze it. I'm like, okay, next one. You know, and then I just submit, submit to so many different places. I don't think about them anymore. I just keep writing. It's all about the next story, the next story, the next story. When I see an an, an email, like inbox, um, there is this magazine. I'm like, oh, okay, the one I submitted to six months ago. <laughs> I was like, uh, rejection. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever, next one. And then, ah, uh, whatever, next one. So I just became, right now, right now, it's just like, two days ago, I received one, but anyway, I've been forgotten what it was. I was like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> so it was just, yeah, it's just going on and, you know, just keep fighting and, and fighting. It's, I can't even, there have been more than 100 rejections. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and like my, my friend Dami Ajayi of Saraba Magazine, you know, made it a joke one day when I shared my graphic, my grant of magazine rejection. It was like, congratulations on your rejections. Like, thank you. <laughs> 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 For you to actually get a rejection from Granta is like they even got it. I mean, they actually said no. We are not going to take this story. That's that's a that's an honor to say to actually respond <laughs> to your reply. I suppose it's something yeah. that you should take into account. And I, I received people, two, mm -hmm. like two tiered rejections from Granta. I was like two tiered, yeah. tiered. They're like like their tiers are like first tier rejections. It's like uh, perhaps you almost got in, but the guy like, the quality is there, but because maybe. The, uh, Fit issue, like okay, it doesn't really fit our man. It doesn't really fit our needs at this time. So, like, mm -hmm. like yeah. normal rejection is like, dear writer, 
or we receive your submission. Uh, thanks for registering. Nah, nah. It's like online. But tier, tier registrations are like, they catch a team game, you read your story with interest and we enjoyed it. And um, please send us more of your work. We'd love to read. Yeah, stuff like that. That's, that's like a tier. That is nice. I mean, compared on the journey, I feel like I have so much more to, to work on when I look at the literary landscape. And it's from the African continent because I'm thinking even of how much, how many African authors I've actually read myself, how many books that I know. It's like nearly everybody knows about Chino Achebe and nearly everybody now knows about Chimamanda. You know, there are names that come up that I think every Cameroonian should know, like Mongo Betty or uh, Imbolombwe. Like there are all these people that, Almost everybody in this that space that I described in the beginning, like those who are sort of good enough to know about writing, but not so good that the world knows them, they know these people. And I'm curious to know your opinion, your take literally on the, the creative landscape, the Cameroonian, creative, to be very specific, not just African, but Cameroonian. What have you seen in your years of writing, submitting, participating in competitions, working, doing workshops, like... Do you see any thread that someone who is trying to get into that space, like somebody, let me say a young person watching us, like, I like to write, you know, I'm interested. My, my dad, I said I'm talented, which is already a great first step. How do I get into that space? What should I know before trying to become a writer? Um, so your question is specific to Cameroon, right? Yes. I, well, let's talk about a space that you know based on your experience as a Cameroonian. Yeah. Cameroon. Um, I love my motherland, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a stone. It's like a brick. But anyway, I, I remember I started by telling you that I my first rejections were in Cameroon and stuff. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and and that's one of the reasons why I went international. I got published internationally be like years before I got published in Cameroon. Wow. Um, yeah, so the space at the yeah, I, when I was writing, um, I, I didn't really. Apart from like, also I was an I was a, I was a rookie, so I didn't know much. Yeah, at the time there was an edition clay, but it published in French. And at the time, when I was like I was like really starting out, they were like you know fading away or something like that. And all the like the publishing scene in Cameroon, they they're, they are like printing presses. They function like printing. They just print books. Mm -hmm. Not much publicity, not much um, not much publicity and marketing. It's just it's very niche in a way. Um, mostly for academics, you know, they just publish and then sort of this kind of click click circle where they just publish each other and then they give each other awards. And you know what I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> and, and and stuff like that. And it's, it's not yeah, but you know, lately um. You know, from like the twenty tens, from the tens, you know, you've got like young publishers who who are really, you know, trying to right those wrongs. Um, I'm talking about Bakwa magazine. Which, shout, out um, yeah, you know, Bakwa. shout out to Sekashu Mark Biban. Um the young creative who started in Cameroon, who's based in Cameroon. I have huge respect for that guy. My friend is just incredible. So Bakwa magazine, um, doing stuff online. And before that there was Palapa Mac Palapala magazine by yeah. Kang Sikawaka. Yeah. I was just communicating with him two days ago. Um, but Palapala had like a more um like a wider outreach. So back all like one well, which was like really um pioneering um like coming in writers, but then other writers too. And then right now there is our friend Raul Jimeli. He has um, yeah. Click Jack magazine. Um Click Jack magazine, they are also uh, uh doing uh, incredible things in their own right, you know. But it's it's like a unified field where publishers are doing things, and, and you know, it's also it's just hard to find. Some of them I just hear for the first time. I'm like, wow, I've never known this publisher before. What's happening? And some of them like in Douala and Base, but you know. and also like and then I think with the, another thing which is like a, a problem in in our country is um the physical component. You know, we don't have we don't have book we don't have book festivals we don't have literary festivals all of those things help to bring people together and educate people about the literary space but you don't have that a lot so even the publishers who are there you don't really know so Cameroon is oh my god it's hard you know, I wouldn't even like advise a young writer to just remain in Cameroon um 
I'm not saying they must go like uh, like Europe, France, or America, or whatever. But you know, they're like uh, based in Nigeria, in Ghana, you know, in Uganda, attack those bases. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. some of them are yeah. really, you know, they have their own problems, but I, I think they are really taking some steps, um, to, to do great work in the dry space. I was I was just talking with actually Howard um, a couple of hours things yesterday when he was just coming up from his panel on AK Festival and I'm hoping to actually get your take on the AK Festival. So I I, I talk about Howard as though everybody knows who Howard is. <laughs> Howard M B Maximus is also a writer and he was shortlisted recently for the Myers Mullen uh, scholarship, which is hoping putting our, keeping our fingers crossed, hoping that he gets it. And I would. I wish to, uh, I, w I would have wanted to attend AK when it was still physical. I mean, Corona is happening right now and it's every, almost everything is online. And I know you attended the AK Festival at the time when you guys uh, went to go and talk about the Limbo. 2017. Festival. Yeah, 2017. <clears throat> when Limbo to Lagos, nonfiction from Cameroon and Nigeria. This book just came out, by the way, published, as you can see here. You have Dami Ajayi, Tekashi Maviban, and Emmanuel Iduma, all Iduma. amazing editors and writers. Yeah, so it was a collaboration between Saraba, Goethe Institute, and Bakwa. And I, I hope I'm not missing the, the the team partners, but you have a story in this particular collection. But before we go to your story, what I want to find yeah. out is your. We talk about Cameroon earlier. You did mention of the fact that you know you are starting in Cameroon right now. As a young writer, you should try to reach out, you know, internationally, and also the fact that there are newer, uh, almost I almost said newer edition houses, which is direct translation from French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Newer publishers who are you know engaged in that. You have people like. Uh, Raul Jimeli, Zekashi Magviban, people are working on making sure that the voices are growing. So before you talk about Cameroon and you've covered that space well for somebody who is jumping in, you know, reach out and look at the new people. Now, on the African landscape, because I know that you've submitted to many places, you have your story that we'll talk about that was published on the journalist's yeah. book review. Yeah. yeah. And internationally as well. And I'm, I want to find out from you what you think has been changing in this space compared to, say, a decade ago. Like, in your journey, you started submitting in 2010, I guess. So started submitting. This has been 10 years of you submitting and getting reactions and doing all that. What do you? What, have, what is the progression you've seen? Like, do you think the writing is improving, getting worse, changing, diversifying? Like, what is your take on that progression of writing from, say, 2010 to 2020 on the African continent? Wow. That's, that's such a broad... Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that question has, like, a broad uh, scope. But you started by talking about AK Festival. I don't know, should I yeah. link to AK Festival? Yes, right? yes, of course. I actually want to talk about AK Festival. It's something that I would personally would wish to attend. And I think it's a, it's a powerful tool and platform that many people are taking advantage of now, which is good. Okay. Um, I can talk about AK Festival and I'll attempt um, a very broad question. Yeah. Um, yeah. AK Festival, it's, I think they are in their sixth, either sixth or seventh year of existence. Um, it's a very young festival. They've not even been, um, um, like existing for, for a decade now. I think it's, it's just like six, seven years in, but the work which um, they have done is amazing. It's a festival which um, um, the Nigerian writer, Lola Shoneni, author of um, The Secret Lives of Baba Sidi's Wives, mm -hmm. a, a yeah. novel, which was long listed for the Women's Prize. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good novel. So that's a novel. So Lola Shonen started this festival in, in Nigeria, in Abiyokuta, in Woleso Inka's village. And um, yeah, it, it was organized in, in Abiyokuta for like four, five, five years. And then recently they the, the transferred it to Lagos. I think the last year's festival was in Lagos. Yeah, so Lola has been able to bring um, African creatives, not just writers, but novelists, poets, like just um, musicians, like people from different like art, people from the, uh, the art space and all over the continent and all over the world from like the UK, different places from, yeah, um, to, to bring them together for like four or five days in Abiyokuta, you know, to share art, you know, art and, and performances and panels it, it, and readings you know it, it's it's i mean i can't i don't i can't even remember i think I, I wrote a whole in my nigeria memoir i like like the second part of my nigeria memoir which i published on saraba magazine the title of my piece there is 
um, you are near yet you are far. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I dedicated a, a good uh, a section of my memoir to the Arcade Festival. She's been able to bring so many African creatives together to, to collaborate. And not just that, the organization is like really the top notch, the top notch. And um, when when I, the, the Limbe Lagos um, exchange project, mm -hmm. we had the first phase, that was in 2017. The first phase was in Limbe in May, 2017. And then, um, in November, we all traveled to, to, to Nigeria, Lagos, or all the writers in the Limbe Lagos workshop to, to, to this festival. And um, it was really great. I met, and, and also it's like a point for people to connect, for writers yeah. to connect yeah. and to know each other. You'll be reading some people for, for like forever and then you meet these people and you can have conversations with them and even like create relationships with them. For example, I met, um, so I, mean, I met Billy McTennan, my friend Billy McTennan. She was the, I think, the West African editor for the Africa Report magazine. And just from my conversation with her, just, we just spoke with her. And then I, I pitched something to her when I got back to Cameroon. And that's how I got into the Africa Report. I just pitched something to Billy. And she was like, oh, this is great. Wrote, yeah. Then I met Jais Fodden, the author of, um, um, what's that novel? This, uh, the Last King of Scotland, which was um, mm -hmm. adapted into a Hollywood movie. Wow. And I was wow. with Giles. You know, and you know, he's a casual Giles, and you know, I, I, through our, through our conversations, I, I, I found myself in the, in the, the my small workshop in Uganda, you know, taught by Giles. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's just, it's a place where you just meet, connect, and like it, it must not be like something that happens. I must go to a workshop, right? I just met like so many uh, different new friends. I met my friend Otto Sirieze Obiyong. We've been communicating on Facebook. I've been blown away by his reading his aces and I met him there. We had all the great conversations. Um I met Ayobami Adebayo, you know, um she wrote his real novel, Stay With Me, which had conversations. It, so it's a place to meet, a place to Did connect. You to meet Nidhi, Nidhi Okorofo was there, I believe. Was it yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. Nidhi, yeah. Uh -huh, that's that's another writer I met. I had conversations with Nidhi. I was like, wow. And she was very she was very kind. She was talking that, to us. I love that woman. She's an amazing writer. She's she, yeah she's so kind. She was just talking to us and giving us writing tips. It's like you guys should write. You guys should write. Publish your stuff. And, yeah and and also it's it's a chance for young writers to meet older, more established writers and get tips on how to grow because um, I remember Sada told me that when he went to Sada Malumfashi, Sada Malumfashi was a Nigerian winner of the of the 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 the, the, the legal <laughs> the Zil Prize. He was a Nigerian winner. Yeah. yeah. He told me that not the year we went, he, he went to oh. Aki Festival the year before and he did not know anything like literary agents. He did not know like submitting the yeah. But they attended this 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 workshop in which um, I forgot the people in I think it was Nedi Korafo and Helen Abila, all these writers, and they told them about literary agents and, and stuff like that, and you know, some it's to magazines. So it's a space where younger writers go to get um, advice and guidance and counsel, yeah, experience from older writers, and also incredible panels. Um, they have great panels, uh, you know. I attended a panel. That panel was fire. I think I wrote I wrote a blog post about that panel. Um, there was a panel called Financing the Arts. Financing the Arts. Okay, no, finance, finance, oh, money, money. Yeah. I think up. Financing the Arts by um Tom Ilube. Tom Ilube, who started the um the surprise, yeah, the, the surprise. Yeah. The No More Awards. Tom Ilube. He, he was fire. And there were all these guys from Nigerian banks talking about financing the arts. I was like, wow. And pitching, you know, pitching, you know, how to pitch to a company to get funding for arts and Nigerian banks that are funding the arts, including the Ake Festival and all of this. And I was like, okay, like mini pitch or long pitch and shop, all of this. And I was like, this is incredible. So you just get like a ton of information from people from different angles and that can help you in your literary career in so many different ways, not just publication, just informing you, you know. I mean, yeah, um, yeah so the Ake Festival has been important like that. It just, it blows your minds to all kinds of possibilities in the art. It's not just publication, you know, it's in the arts, you know, relationships with writers and, 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 and editors and what you can you can meet someone that you, you know you you know person invite you to a workshop in another country and all that. So our uh, festival has done that. And really. And um oh also by the way, um uh, Lola Shone who started Ake Festival, she traveled to this was before well this was when Corona just started happening. She traveled yeah. to the US yeah. She traveled to the U.S. in, in May 
to attend uh, the AWP conference. AWP is the biggest literary conference in the US, the Association of Writing and Writing Programs. And she attended it, it was in San Antonio. And I attended her panel and I, I met I met uh, Lula after that, we spoke, we, we had a great time. You know, she was so happy you know, that she met me and, and she went back, you know. So because I had been to Nigeria before and spoken her in Nigeria, you know, one of the things that really inspired me to go to San Antonio was like, oh, Lola is coming. I went to San Antonio because I, you know, and I went specifically for Lola's panel. So, um, guys done a lot. So that's okay. And then there have been other fest festivals too. Um, there was a Kwani Lifters in, in Kenya, um, doing a kind of, you know, I, I don't know if they still exist anymore. And then there was a Rightivism Literary Festival in Uganda. Um, Rightivism is, I think, Rightivism is on hiatus right now or something. I don't know what happened. Um, also, as South Africa has, you know, you know, really, really good festivals. There's the Open Book SA, and there, there's, there's like three or four literary festivals in, in in South Africa. So I think these festivals are, you know, in French and everywhere you can get to, people can get to bond. Uh, meet yeah. Yeah. Literary. I think uh, Zekashu attended another one in Somaliland. There's a Hagesa Book Festival with uh, with um, a very you know nice man called Jama Musa. So there's been this couple of festivals. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to jump now. Sorry, we can jump into um, your perspective what, on what has changed so far. Yeah, yeah, what has changed so far on the literary landscape in Africa? I think there's been a lot of progress with the quality of the writing. The quality of the writing, um, before like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, young writers who, who, who wanted to start out you not really have like feedback to your stories. You, you don't have like an accomplished writer who like really give feedback to your stories. So there was that growth element, which was, you know, how do you grow when you don't get feedback from, mm. like, you know, like really like workshops, you know, all of those things started like in the past 10 years. About there used to be, but not quite. Um, except for like, the Cain Price workshop, which is like a, you know, like a Western funded workshop. But right now you get, a lot of workshops organized by African writers themselves, you know, funded by African writers themselves. Here they can get wasting funding sometimes, but you know, you get a lot of workshops, um, one day workshops, one week workshops, like the one we had, uh, a late yeah. person yeah. workshop. It was a six day workshop in Limbe, and then there was like six, yeah. Um, there's been this Chimamanda's workshop in, in Lagos. You know, they're always like, you know, 20 writers every year go to Chimamanda's, and that's been existing for a decade. So you get all these workshops. So the thing is, you get now a situation where um, young writers really improve their writing skills and you have like these amazing stories, um, amazing stories, you know, which are being written by really young young writers, 23, 22. And then which is a workshop, you have residencies. They're not a lot, but you know, there, there's like, there's the, there's one in Nigeria, I forgot the name. Uh, Howard attended that one, what's the name again? I um, can remember. Ebedi residency, there is the Ebedi mm -hmm. residency in Nigeria. I would attend that. Sekashu Makfran was attend that. There is also this Stellan Bosch residence in South Africa. You know, residencies are not a lot. So writers go there to these places to, you know, create work and, and, and write. So you get a situation where young writers are doing incredible things with their writing right now, improving, and also getting published in, 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 in these spaces. And, um, uh, translation, there are more translation projects, English, French, you know, and stuff like, and then Swahili, English, and all of that, it's, it's, it's on the rise. Yeah. And yeah. so you just get like, to the African literary space. Also the African publishers are like, I think we spoke about that before, the African publishers are like really, really, the African publishers right now who, you know, a few of them can really compete, you know. Like which ones? Like, Cassava Republic. <laughs> Cassava Republic. Republic is they have like a, an office in the UK, you know. Yeah. Was that uh, uh, Bab uh, Yusuf? My name is yeah, ba Yusuf yeah, Bakari. Ah, Bakari. I just yeah. Okay. Yusuf Bakari, Bakari Yusuf. She started Cassava Republic, and she has like a, an office in London, and you know, Bibi Bakari Yusuf. Yes. Yeah, Bibi Bakari Yusuf. Bibi Bakari Yusuf. Yes, that's the name, and. They're publishing works and they did functioning, you know, self-sufficient. They do this stuff. I mean, they have like an office in London run by them. Um, yeah. They're yeah. like an outreach in, in the US. Um, 
you know, there is a situation right now where there is this writer called Sarah Ledipo Manika. She's a Nigerian writer. But Sarah Ledipo Manika said she chose Cassava Republic over a Western publisher. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. Yeah, and this is a, this is a writer who's based and mostly based in the US, choosing an African publisher over a Western publisher. She said that. That is me. Uh, yeah, and you've got uh, Emmanuel Iduma who edited our anthology. I think his first book was published, I forgot who published, but Cassava Republic published his second collection of aces. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think Abubakar Adam Ibrahim is also signed to Cassava. So you've got, so it's not just Cassava, there's also, there's also Lola Shoni again, also she's getting into the publishing space with Weeda Books. Weeda Books published the Nigerian edition of um, uh, Stay With Me by Ayubami Adebayo. And then there is this brilliant mm -hmm. poet called Logan February. Um, Weeda Books also published that one. And then Bakwa Books, our friend Zekashu Magazine. Yep. You know, after 10 right years here. of doing Bakwa mm -hmm. Magazine, yeah, he branched into book publishing and he's published uh, Bakwa Books, even though what you just, uh, the book you just pointed, there's more of a Bakwa Magazine book. Um, you know, so the Bakwa Books are like, um, there are two anthologies. <laughs> Yeah, is, yeah, there I've is, not uh, had copies uh, of those yet. Yeah, there is um oh oh I just forgot the name of uh, the anthology. Oh Passion and uh, Ink. Passion, oh, Passion and Ink. Oh, yeah. Passion and Ink, New Voice from Cameroon. That's the first Baka book. And then there is one about like uh, young writers. It's a young writers workshop. They're also going to publish um mm -hmm. that book. And, well we could just add that, but that that's more that's hey. technically hey. Baka magazine. Because that's back one nine. So that's yeah. technically a Baka magazine book. And there is yeah. also yeah. There's also Sub-Saharan publishers in Ghana. Sub-Saharan, at the time I attended the King Price workshop in Ghana, Sub-Saharan publisher, had, they had sold as in 17,000 copies of the King Price anthologies. Those are those are insane numbers. The King Price anthologies, they have sold more books of, they have sold more King Price anthology, more copies of the, the King Price anthologies than, than, um, than the, the, the price had sold in London or something. You know, I remember, yeah, the director wow. of the prize wow. really congratulated the, the lady who, yeah. The, the, why the do you think that happened? Happen? Yeah. Because the perspective is like, what's your take on why are they able to, to sell more copies there? Like, yeah, it's great. It's surprising. It's amazing. But why? Why is this happening now? Why is this happening now? Good good question. Um, yeah. Um, so she had sold, they had sold 17,000 copies. And the director of the game prize kept talking about, wow, this, these numbers are just insane. Even in London, they had. I don't think that sold as many copies in London. Now, what happened is uh, the way I'll answer your question is I'll relate back to Sarah Lidipo Manika, and I think this makes sense why she chose Casava Republic over any other imprint. She a second novel. I forgot the title. It has something to do with a, a, a move. Sarah Lidipo's second novel sold two million copies in Nigeria alone. I'm not even kidding. Her book sold. Two million copies in Nigeria alone. That those numbers you don't get in the West. You don't even get such numbers in the West. Why? I read a whole uh, AC. Somebody wrote a whole article about the sales of that book. First, it got into the jam syllable, so it was like um, it was like um, it was a book was like an examination text for jam. And you know, you know, so many students. In, in, I know Nigeria with this population more than ninety million. You can imagine the number of students who buy that book oh, as a text for jam. Not just that, um, the people who marketed that book took it to the people. They're like, okay, how can we market these books? They took it to um, the, the the salons, you know, where women style their hair. Yeah. So the books. Yeah. The they took it to the people. They took it to like famous restaurants in like Lagos and different restaurants. Like there's a restaurant in, in Lagos called Terra Culture. It's mm -hmm. like a book themed restaurant. So they took it to the people. When in salons, I think even churches. So they took the book everywhere, and those those books sold a lot. Even I heard like even the Nigerian uh, print of Americana by Chimamanda. I heard it was selling like hotcakes. It was selling everywhere. Also, they make these books. They these books are not as expensive as it is in the West, you know. But the, the downside with that is like the, the quality would always suffer. The quality would go down for it, you know. So it's affordable. So it's, nice. it's affordable and it's everywhere. It's available, yeah. Yeah. So it's available it's the creatures, and then people can just grab this book. So, yeah, I, I, that's that's why I can see why Israeli Diplomanica would choose Casa Republic over this 
um, yeah. West Zimbabwe's. And there, there are just so many. Um, in Zimbabwe, there is Weaver Press. There's this lady guard. How do you know all these names? Because you keep calling these names as though they're like, you know, like your cousins and Bro, friends. I've <laughs> been on the African literary space for 10 years. I've been reading all kinds of articles, all kinds of aces, yeah. um, all kinds um, in Nigeria. There was Parisa Publishers. There's just um, in Uganda, there was Right Civism, and then they had the anthology. Let's not even get in South Africa. South Africa has like a whole, like, almost self sustaining ecosystem. You know, there's, Peng, there's a Penguin Random House, then there's Penguin Han Random House, South Africa. Yeah, Cameroon. Most Cameroon. of my South African writer friends, they just they publish there, they sell their books there, they win their awards there, you know. They can only, yeah. like, some like, prizes and go, you know. Yeah, South Africa is like a. So yeah, it's, well, it's, like, it's, it's improving. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that there's just two problems, there's two problems, but. What are some of those problems that uh, you think is almost everywhere, every con African country? Um, availability. Um, I just gave this case of, of Sarah Lady, Sarah Lady Bo Manika's book in Nigeria selling two million copies. Um, you don't find such, such examples in so many different countries. And just, bro, logistics is a problem. Mm -hmm. get, logistics is just, I mean, I was talking with Zekashi Mariwa, he said, Studying Baka books was like the most difficult project he had ever done in his whole life. You know, the logistics. If you want to post a book, it's ridiculously expensive to like post a book. How do you ship, you know, lots of copies to okay, let's say you're a writer, you're going to Ake Festival. The festival has thousands of people. And you you if you get if you get two thousand, you know, two thousand copies of your book, you'll be able to sell it there. How do you transport all of those copies to Nigeria? You pay some ridiculous amounts of money to carry on a plane. You, know, you spend ridiculous amounts of money to like send it over land. Just the, like the transport, it's the transport network. It's it's yeah. So just we need like we need. I think we need like a special postal system for for books. Mm. Start, yeah, and then some of this funny funny corruption. I remember when I was in 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 Douala, um, that that's another thing too. Cameroon has like this big 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 book problem. I workshops are like Sahara like. And I remember when I was in Douala, um, um, a few writers, friends in the U.S. would send me books. And I would go to, and they'll pay, like, they'll pay everything, postage. And I will go to the, um, the post and travel oh, okay. uh, uh, post and travel uh, and journal, I want to collect my books. And they'll calculate some money and tell me, you need to pay 8,000 francs. I'm like, that person sent the book over there and, like, they was posted everything. They're like, no, no, we, we kept it in, in we kept it in the warehouse, and then you know, each day in the warehouse is some this is 300 francs. And then the funny thing is when the books get there, they will not tell you the books arrive. You only hear like three weeks later. And it's like, oh no, the books have been in the warehouse for three weeks. So three weeks times 300 francs is like this is this is so you pay ten thousand francs, you pay eight thousand and you know, it's just That's and you see like like, you know, they've cut the books in like half and open, you know, probably to to see. Like they'll cut like the package with like a pair of scissors and cut it in half and just see your books open everywhere and stop being so all of this little corruption, all of this dysfunctional. Yeah. Talking so about logistics talking problems, about also marketing yeah. problems and all of those things. At, you know, we've we've talked a lot about the African landscape and publishing in yeah. general and writing and all that. And I would like to get now more into your story as a writer, particularly because MFA has been something that I considered doing, like doing a Masters of Fine Arts. I know it's, it was one of those parts that some people say, well, whether you do an MFA or not, a writer should be writing. You should actually, you know, MFA just gives you the opportunity to write. And then, you know, some people should not seek to do it. You should actually focus on writing. There's all these funny schools of thought about it. And why don't you talk about two things in this? Because first, there's your story on the Johannesburg Review of Books that made me very angry. Very angry, not because it, it may be angry because it was true. Like the things you wrote yes. about in that particular story was you're writing about your, your trilogy of uh, visa rejections. Visa rejections. Yeah, and that was the three different instances during which you went. You had your documents. You had everything. In fact, if you're watching this and you haven't heard that story, you should go read it. If you've traveled out of the continent, you know exactly what he's talking about. And yeah. you know what you talk about your personality and your persistence and your ability to go there. Like I think that that just exemplifies the kind of person that you are getting your house burned down and getting a rejection from a visa and one, two, three times. And finally, you know, only when you get the acceptance is one of those like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd like to find out 
two things. I mean, it's a test of that story because your perspective on the on travel on the African continent and your you writing that story are very closely linked. It's because of that that you wrote the particular story. So I'd like you to, if you can take us through this journey of someone who is trying to achieve his goals. You write your application. The organization says, yes, come to our country and do this thing. You deposit your documents and they're like, uh, yeah, no, we're not sure they're going to go back. Like, what goes on in your mind? Do you have, you've written the article, but I want to hear from you. What? How did you feel to have to keep going after these goals over and over and getting rejected all the time for something that was so clearly, you know, weird and strange? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the reaction to that article has been overwhelming, really. I wrote that article again about rejections. This article, mm -hmm. Kanga, you don't believe it. This article has been rejected by 13 literary magazines. Tres. What? Tres. 13 literary magazines. Said no, they don't want this. Was that the yeah. pitch or the story itself? The story itself, Charles Literary was rejected by 13 literary magazines. Or mostly like mostly, mostly, mostly American, mostly American literary magazines. However, about half of them send very beautiful notes. It's like, we're rejecting this, but it's a beautiful story. And to be able to put your pain and yourself on the page like that, that was like really bold. That was, um, so I had like some really beautiful, and I really, I think it's just the, 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 the piece of mine which I've submitted the most to any magazine because I totally believed in it. There were so many compelling moments in that story that I believe that when it comes out to the world, um, people will relate to it. But not 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 like the way um we did. So I just kept submitting it, and it, it got uh picked up by the Johannesburg Review, and the guy was actually surprised when he when he when he like sent the acceptance. Was like, is this because I sent it to him? It was, it was only about like maybe a month and a half later that he replied. Only like, a oh. month and a half later, guys. Only a month and yes, a half. Only, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like six months, seven months. All these big magazines. It's like six, seven months, and then it was like. Is this like we like it's a really good piece? We want to publish it. Is this still available? I was like, yes. Ah. And he published it and then and you got you uh, got paid for that, right? Paid. Yeah, I got paid for that. I can't tell you money. Not tell me hey, see, all I need to know is that your writing is paying. I think that's something that people yeah, yeah. realize that you can actually make no, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they paid me for that. So it, it got out and the reaction to it was like I it, I had like 20 retweets in like two days on, on Twitter when I shared it. I had like 15 new followers, people people retweeting and saying. So now for, I had like three sets of reactions for the AC. The first is my family members who, who had been like extended family, like cousins, Montana and stuff, who had been to embassies and, you know, suffered from much like rejection fate. Like two or three of them. They were like they were like laughing like ha ah, 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 ah. ha like why are you laughing? It's like, bro, I was totally like it is me one hundred percent. It's like I saw myself, so I'm like he, this is my pain. And then, also, um, like you said, you were furious. Um, I was speaking to a lady recently. She said she was angry. Now people were angry on my behalf. They were like, <laughs> this guy had something clear. He had a valid reason to go. And they were Why are you saying no? Why do you keep saying no all the time? And then some people, like now, uh, my like American like friends and people in the MFA and stuff who do not know the pain of, of it, because if you have an American passport, you can pretty much go anywhere in the world. Yeah. And yeah. some of them don't know these things. So they had this 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 extreme shock. Like, is this possible? Like it was a world like it was a world i don't know like you know how africans suffered embassies it was a world which, you know, so it was like just extreme shock and for some extreme anger and my cousins were like well some of them were like bro this pain this this pain i felt this your pain so some people were furious some people were angry some people laughed and then you know some people were like uh traveling white black this is all you get traveling white african so yeah so I, I intended the piece, I intended for it to be a, a conversation starter, like, you know, because we had this, and I think we need to like stop that attitude. We had this thing in Cameroon where people want to go abroad and then you go to the embassy and then you get rejected a visa by a condescending consular officer who's belittling, who belittle you. I mean, like, yeah, and go to the 
who only goes to the US when he becomes an, an accomplished writer. Yeah, that was that was now, very not necessary. Yeah, I, I mean, I had like I had that in like almost all the interviews. Now you get all of that, you know, condescending response. And when you, when you pay two hundred dollars for that, and you go back to your digital, you go back to to Limbe, to Boya, to Kuma, whatever, and you hide, you know, you don't want to let anybody know that you had a visa rejection because you're afraid, like, oh, this one wanted to, you know, the guy one for bush bear, plan no one, you want to go and then, yeah, you, you want to leave it for years, you hide it, you, you deal with that pain, you know, and when you pay money for that visa. It should be on the. It should be the other way around. It should be the consular officers feeling that shame for putting yeah, you that. that I'm not saying, saying, sorry, they were gonna give you this. Yeah, I'm not saying that they should give every African a visa. If they want to reject visas, fine, but give one, give valid reasons, and two, don't, don't, don't be condescending towards people. Don't lead to people. Just treat people with kindness and treat people with respect while you reject them the visas. You know. Stop. Don't don't be belittling. Don't be condescending. So that that was just my point. And well, one of the reasons, chief reasons why I wrote this piece is, you know, when you have this pain, because people are going through the pain of visa rejections, you go and suffer alone, suffer in silence. Is come out, tell your story to your family and your friends, and you know, have conversations and 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 deal with that pain. This piece was cathartic for me because I decided to tell my story. I was like, I'm gonna. By the way, I wrote it and I, I wrote it. I was in Cameroon. I was sending it to places I was still in Cameroon. So it's not like I came to the US. That's what I decided. If yes, if I was oh, in Cameroon, oh. I would still publish it. I started submitting it way back in Cameroon. So my idea was to, you know, inspire people to start talking about their visa rejections because it is something. Um, I mean, it's a pain that you go through and you just suffer in silence and you're scared that people will laugh at you like, oh, he wanted to go to the US. is planning and work. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. And, and then on, on the other hand, like, well, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, um, talk about it. But on the other hand, is there is a situation where some other Africans go to to embassies, you know, there's the, the whole brain drain concept. Some mm -hmm. other Africans go to embassies with like full scholarships, and you know, want to go to embassy with like full scholarship, you know, and they look and like, oh, this person can contribute to our economy. Come in. They, they don't even ask you so many questions. Just like, oh, that's your visa, because they know that, you know, you go to the U.S. and you work or something, and you contribute to the economy. So, you know, that aspect I didn't touch because, um, because I, I faced the other aspect. But there's also the other aspect where some people go to embassies, and you know, because you know, they have like smart, you know, they yeah. have like yeah. grades and stuff, and they have like scholarships. They just give them visas easily without any questions. So, I was, yeah. I was we, we jumped into the story. And thanks, thanks for sharing that because I know that there's a lot that went into that story and the thing that got me upset, even though personally I've not had any relation, like the, the only time I ever applied for a visa, it got accepted and I'm now living in the US. Like I never had to go through that, but I've heard a lot of stories about that. A lot of stories of people who are trying to come to the US who go through all kinds of ways to get there. So I, I can empathize and imagine the difficulty of getting you know, you have everything in place. You've done your application. You've paid the money. You're not actually, you know, like for you, you were trying to go and uh, attend a workshop and come back and do your thing. Like you weren't in that mindset. But on the other side too, like I've read stories from, uh, in this collection, you had, there's a lot of travel stories in this particular collection from Bakwa. So uh, Anne-Marie Bifun talked about the same similar story. Uh, Gimbis wrote this, some, this, like, in fact, every single story in this book is about travel. So this is one yeah. collection that you should get. And you get That's the aspect yeah, yeah, yeah. Taxi driver drives you nowhere and other stories. And I, I love a lot of the stories in it. And there's another aspect of this travel path that most people don't talk about. We talk about, you know, the rejection and the difficulty and the condescension. But then there are other people, like the reason why these people are this condescending, in my opinion, could be because they see people who try foul play to leave the country. Like there's, I feel like there's a lot more people who are trying to do the negatives and the people are good. And then everybody now gets bonded up, like everybody's struggling to leave yeah. because... Yeah, and I don't think that's that's very fair. Yeah, 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 you're right on point. You're right on point. I actually wrote about it in my essay. I said there are lots of Cameroonians I know who like broke Cameroonians who who go to embassies and tell the most blatant lies and present the greatest fakes in the names of documents and they get yeah. Because of those yeah. sort of foul play. And now when the, the person who is real comes, the consular officers don't know uh, who is who. Yeah, so that yeah. So there is a there is some complexity to the whole thing. So it's not just all about blame on the consular officers. I actually mentioned yeah. I actually made sure that I, yeah. I made a touch on the complexity. There's yeah. 
Oh yeah. You know, yeah. So many Africans go there, you know, which is like big stories and big documents. Cool. Just annoy the guys. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe you can maybe you you're, you're, you're maybe you're coming to the consular office that when somebody just left with some ridiculous document and he's you know he's being <laughs> mad. I just and carried he just the brunt feels of the position. hang of that on you and you know. Oh you know. people are human after all, so yeah, yeah, so um, there's complexity. It's not like I'm. It's not like I'm saying they're all lions and just heartless. You know? It's yeah. complex. Sometimes yeah. Africans can really annoy and them. For those who are watching, we already crossed the the hour mark, so we'll soon be able to get questions from you. If you have any questions to ask uh, Ketcha, you can send it. I'll make sure to put on the screen and talk about it. I'll be highlighting all the, the comments and everything. As I always like to use that first hour to get to know uh, my guests a little bit more. And one thing that we'll talk about before we get the questions is. The MFA you want life. To talk about the MFA, yeah. Yes, because I don't even know how you got into your current studies. Like, tell us that story. How did you apply? What happened? Like, how did you end up where you are today, studying, you know, a master's in fine arts in writing? That was hard. So many rejections. Um, MFAs. I started. Yeah, I, I started. It's um, when I got into writing deeper and deeper and getting published. I was like, okay. I really love this. It's my passion. It really gives me the most joy. Um, if I become a, write, a writer and a creative writing teacher, maybe a screenwriter, you know, if I make a career of this, I think I'll, I'll really be a happy person. It will give me, it will fulfill my purpose in life. So in 2013, I was communicating with a few African writer friends. Um, um, yeah. Um, when I attended the King Prize workshop and came back and I wrote this story titled Bahala Lizard. Um, mm. Yeah, and so many friends, African writer friends were like, this This is a really beautiful story. And um, some of those African writer friends had, you know, had completed uh, MFA degrees. They're like, you should try, you should try out, you never know. Uh, application season is in November. Um, I was like, okay, I should probably, and some of them were like willing to write uh, recommendation letters for me. Like, okay, I should try this out. So the first time was in 2015. So in 2015, um, I applied to a couple of schools, uh, Syracuse University in New York, uh, Pratt, Pratt Institute in New York. Um, um, I do so many other schools. I applied to like five schools. There was like um, McNeese University in Louisiana. There's just different schools. So this MFA is out, hard to get in. Some like most MFAs in America, like the top tier ones, getting in is like five percent, five percent chance mm -hmm. to get in. Yeah, and then some at ten percent. Second state MFA. Five percent acceptance rate. Five percent acceptance rate. How do you select um, students? Yeah, that's how you should ask that question to them because they are about to select. <laughs> Is it okay? I'm trying to understand. Like the five percent, is it that you have you know like five percent of people who apply are accepted? Oh, yeah, I, I said five percent acceptance rate. Schools like okay. Columbia, Columbia, and and Iowa, 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 Iowa Writers Workshop. It's, it's like it, it gets the most application. They get like a thousand plus application, and they only they only admit twenty five for, for fiction, twenty five for poetry. And then other schools like Columbia, like um, Michigan, like um, Madison and Wisconsin, Mad uh, Madison University, Wisconsin. They get like you know, five hundred, six hundred, and then they only admit like eight. Nine, ten, eleven, depending on the school. Some schools are like, you know, big MFAs. It is just like I was like the most twenty five, but most schools are like between six to eight. Syracuse is like six, and then you get like five hundred. That's just it's like five percent. It's really hard to get in. Um, yeah. So, I so, you pay for this application, right? Yeah, bro, you pay, you pay, you pay. <laughs> You send all this money. Seventy-five, seventy-five dollars, ninety dollars, eighty dollars <laughs> to apply to get a chance, and then you get rejected over and, and over get, and over. You're you you are applying knowing that you have like a ninety-five percent, um, you know, ninety-five percent. You're ninety-five percent sure you're going to get rejected. So yeah, so let me come back to the specific. So I applied yeah. to five schools in 2015: Syracuse, Pratt, McNeese University. I, I got rejected for all except Pratt. Um, no, and in, in 2015, I got rejected for all, I applied to like four schools. And then in 2016, I applied to five schools in 2015, I got rejected for all, all, all the schools. And then I applied in 2016, I applied to four schools, including Pratt Institute, New York, and I got accepted. 
with a partial scholarship of eleven thousand dollars, and I was like, yeah, 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 I got it. And then they sent me like the whole like like roster everything, and then I saw like the whole thing, like the whole years, the whole thing was like probably like sixty six thousand dollars. So I needed to like fetch fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Yeah, I think I wrote about it in the AC. So it's just like, yeah. 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 My uh, my family was like, eh, bro, no, that could have that got money. <laughs> change your dreams, but I change your yeah, dreams. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, that's yeah. So it's is yeah, so yeah, I couldn't uh, I couldn't get to to Pratt and then and, and uh, it, in 2017, that was when I went to like Lagos, Limbe. I was like, nah, I'm not doing this anymore. I applied to nine schools at the time. 2017, I was like, nah, and then I was going to Germany, I was like, okay. I'm going to my direction residency. I don't need any MFA thing right now. I, I went three months residency. I did some good work on a novel, uh, which I put on hold. And then I, I, came, I went back to Cameroon. And while I was in Germany, I applied to Texas State MFA. And then I applied to um, Ole Miss, University of Mississippi Ole. Um, then I went back to Cameroon. And then Ole Miss, I got, it's in two phases. So uh, Ole Miss, that's University of Mississippi Ole. Um, I got into phase one. They're like, oh, congratulations. You know, you got into phase one. I was like, okay. Now I was waiting for Texas State MFA for like forever. And then Ole Miss, I yeah, sent like my trash kick and stuff. And then Ole Miss was like, sorry, phase two, you didn't make it. And then I was at, yeah, I was at night. Uh, Texas State MFA, they, um, there's this English proficiency thing. And um, yeah, they, but, which I like my TOEFL, my TOEFL that expired because it's two years. I wrote in 2015 to apply for all the schools and then it expired in 2017. So in 2018, I applied, yeah. So they were like, um, we can write a letter to the graduate college so they can like waive your TOEFL and, you know, so you can just apply without the English proficiency thing. So the, the, the coordinator of the program had written my uh, uh, letter to the graduate college and I was waiting for the response and I was jittery. So I was asking him, because we were communicating on WhatsApp, I was like, oh, okay, so Stan, um, so what about my TOEFL? It's been a month now. I don't want to bother you, but it's been a month now. Just checking. Sorry. And then he wrote to me at 11, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and well, usually if you get into an MFA, well, for the American students, they'll call you. They'll call you on the phone. Tell you okay, come go. This is this is from University of Nebraska. We want to tell you that you got it, and then you scream yeah and stuff, and then you start talking. About <laughs> that. Oh, I like writing stuff. But I was in camera at the time, and you know, that was like April. That was like a month after, like almost everybody had their application, and I was writing him like um. So I was asking, I had that question about talk of English proficiency, and then he wrote he wrote back to me. He was like, yeah, catcher. Um, we we got. I was supposed to get back to you a few days ago, but sorry, sorry, sorry. Like things got hectic. Oh, actually, we cleared that hurdle. We, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, we cleared the hurdle. The English proficiency thing is cool. And I want to tell you some good news, Catcher, that you got into text the MFA. I was like, 11 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock. Where, where I, were I you? Froze. I just froze on my phone. Like, where were what? you? I was at home. I was in Douala at the time. I was in Douala. I was in my house in, in, in um, Doc Passy. I just held the phone. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was asking you about my English proficiency. I was like, I, <laughs> I got English proficiency and I got it. It was like, I'm a bunch of level schools. I don't know. <laughs> wow. And yeah, go, go, go on. Yeah. Well, Texas State MFA, there's just like 9%. So, 9%. Nine, nine so how, many of you are, how many of you are in class? Oh, for my cohort. Yeah, my your cohort. cohort. Yeah, my cohort. We are, because there's fiction and poetry. My cohort, it's 11 for fiction. And then, no, let me see. We're 21 in total. 21 in total. Yeah, 11 for fiction, 10 for poetry. So it's Is it what you had imagined? <laughs> Sorry? Is it what you had imagined when you applied? Like, what you're going through now, is that something that you had pictured? Oh, you mean the like the, the number the of... The, oh, okay. That, that's, that's like being here now. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Oh, how, how the program is going right now. Yeah, it is. It is very intensive. It is very intensive. Come on, it is. Yeah, but I sign up for it. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I'm not complaining. But it's just intensive. But it's, it's, and before it's you continue, did you actually get a scholarship for this one, or you also so you had to pay for it? I mean, completely. Like, was this a full scholarship, or no? You had to cover the money uh, to get be, it. Done? Most, it's, 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 it's mostly it's like mm, maybe eighty percent. 
but, but I still pay like for the rest. I still pay for it's like eighty eighty percent. Then the other right. things like your health insurance and, and stuff. Yeah. So um, uh, you were talking I, about I, the I, program. I, you know the way it looks program, like. Yeah, the program. It, it is. Yeah, it is rigorous. It is. There's a lot. Of, it's a three year program, by the way. So three years. Yeah. We have many many uh, writing programs in the U.S. Are, are three year three year programs. So it's just a lot of academic rigidity. So you have a lot of workshops. There are four workshops and over the span of those six semesters. You have four workshops. So they have workshops for four different semesters. And you submit um, you submit your work to, to, to workshop. Um, there are like three workshops every semester. So you submit your work and you get critiqued by, by your peers. That's just one this workshop. And then they're like, you know, they're like normal courses now. You do like different courses. Um, I mean, it's just right now, this semester, I'm doing a TV writing course, which is like very, very, um, yeah, with the director writing program, who's a screenwriter himself. He co-wrote, he co-wrote, uh, 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 he's co-wrote uh, 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 it's a TV series called Z, the beginning of everything about the life of Zelda, sorry, Zelda, the wife of uh, Scott Fitzgerald, which sort of mm. the program was killed. It was killed after season one. It went off end season one. We're sort of just doing a season two right now, not to shoot, but just, we continue the story yeah and then it's just it's just different things um you know what point of view we, just, we did a whole course on point of view first person second person third person a whole semester it was very intensive you read like six seven short stories every week for each class and go and talk about yeah bro is that six like five six stories every week for for yeah and then you talk about point of view you spend we spend like because yeah, i remember it was last year first year we spend like a month alone just on the third person. And then like, okay, third person, different types, like different type of third, and then you go now the next month, second person. It's all about you, 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 stories on you, 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 and then the next month, third month, it's like all first person. I, 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 I different stories on I, I was like, this is insane. I only knew that there are three different types. I didn't know that there was like second person, and different type of second person, different type of like this, wow. It's like different stories, different, and then some people just combine everything. It's just, and then the other teacher courses, you do like five teacher courses to graduate. Um, um, yeah, and then there's just so many different things. Um, I did a course called editing, editing the professional publication Porterhouse Review. So it's all about, um, yeah, editing the the because our school literary journal is called Porterhouse Review. Um, editing the house review. Um, so we we read slush, we read slush. We just talk about you know magazines. What slush? Or, Slush pile. Slush pile is like the submissions which come in, yeah. Okay. So what we submit is like slush pile with with slush. Um so everybody every writer in class gets. So I read for my own pile, yeah, my slush pile, like my own I read 34 short stories. Yeah. And I read I kind of begin to imagine how you go through all this and like no wonder you have no time to to do I don't know nearly anything else. It is it, yeah, it's it's insane. And, and you know? It does seem like it's worth it for you. It's worth it, yeah. It's worth it. Um, it really builds you. It really builds you. Um, like right now with the TV writing course, what we're doing, I've done so much research about the life of F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda Sarri, his wife. So much research about them. I just wild. I just have this wide pile of information about the Scots, the Fitzgeralds in my head because we're writing TV. So it's just um, yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's really intensive. I read not less. I read not less than a hundred pages every week, every week, each week, every single week, every not less than some sometimes more. Um, it's really intensive. So it, it's so intensive, like you you literally steal the time to write. Sometimes you just need to write. And you're still you're still able to submit your own stories while reading and consuming all this content. I have a workshop. I have to submit. I have to submit my story on November seventeenth for a workshop on December second. <laughs> At act workshop, no. um, you have three I, workshops every semester. Um, because I'm doing a novel this semester, so they combine two workshops into one because you're sending yeah. like a lot, a lot, a lot of pages. So we had three where. Uh, Three workshops and the next semester. So you have four. You have four semesters. So you have to do workshop. So that's four times three. So you have like twelve submissions over your three years. So you need to be productive while studying, and you know it's it's rigorous. But I love it because it 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 builds you. It builds you. 
Yeah. And also writing to that, it, it gives you discipline because with this workshop, you're writing to deadlines. So you need to submit a workshop on this day and this. So you write, so it builds discipline and rigor. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I would love to hear your take on, um, because so far it looks like you've spent a lot of time ever since you've been here, basically, I mean, the US studying and writing and doing all this work. And I'm curious to know, like, it's something that we could talk about, you can just, you know, briefly talk about this, your experience of America, you know, compared to what you thought about maybe while in Cameroon, because I've written in my own, I think I've gotten disgusted with my own writing about being an immigrant in the US and I've just stopped and I just, I'm not able to write anymore. <laughs> I've read a lot of those articles. I've read about yeah. at least five or six of them. Of yeah. An and I, I'm, I'm wondering if you've had your own personal, you know, take on that being in the US and, you know, living here. What has that been for you so far? Oh, the culture shock was, the culture shock was insane. That's like the, the culture shock. Like even right now, I'm like studying American culture and it's, it's so different. So the culture shock hit me, really hit me. Um, I actually wrote, a, a, actually a, I wrote something like before this trial of visa rejections, I published another uh, essay on the Johannesburg Review titled Letter from Texas, a letter which I wrote to dad. Um, it, it covers uh, uh, like the immigrant perspective and of course like COVID and, and, and racism, which spread all of those things. It covers, it covers a lot of that. So, and I'm in Texas. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, if I want to talk about that, we will probably just go on to have three hours. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely <laughs> have to keep that for another day. <laughs> yeah, we can so, keep that um, for another day. Yeah. Yes, there, there's been a lot of culture shock and, um, you know, I have like so many documented thoughts in, 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 in that in that regard. And and also in, in the MFA, being an African artist in the MFA too, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, how, yeah, how is that? Because I know we've had a conversation where we talked about the fact that you write some stories and then you have, you know, you talk about things that are very contextual, very Cameroonian, culturally based. And then you get feedback that shows that these people actually get where you're coming from. Like, do you have any examples of such and how have you been able to actually deal with that as a writer and trying to, you know, learn while letting people know like, hey, by the way, you don't really know what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. This is why it is. How, how has that been? It has been quite an experience. I had a workshop. I wrote a story about. I'm sure you know. I wake up. Yeah, I woke up. I wake up. Yeah. 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 So I wrote a story where there was a I woke up character, somebody who just you know wake up from the dead and go somewhere else and starts living, you know. Yeah. And it was very alien. I had like everybody in the workshop was like, "Oh, she's a ghost. Oh, she's not a ghost. Oh, she's a ghost. Um, oh, she he's trying to write a ghost story. No, no, he's trying to subvert a ghost story. It's just it was ghost, ghost, ghost." You know, and I came with this rule, with this, with this notion of if you're in your workshop, you have to be a fly on the wall without saying anything. You know, and I really suppose I was really supposed to say something, so I ended up having like a not a very productive workshop on that because they couldn't get the context of die wake up, you know, a character who just dies and comes and leaves somewhere else. So that's something I do in my stories is um, um mythology, like the African mythology and um um. The, super, the African supernatural is something which I really impart into my writing, and because it's just they, they, it's not coming like from a bad place. They don't come from bad. They're not ill intention with their. Yeah. With their yeah. I have like my cohort, especially. I have like one of the. Um, a lot of our instructors comment about our sibling love, or uh, not sibling love, our cohort love for each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so it's not it's not like ill intention, but you know, you get this place where there is some bias against your writing because it's something you don't know. So the, the nearest thing to a die wake up that I know is a ghost. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah, so I had this, yeah. So I had, yeah, my workshop ended up being not very productive. And again, um, I'm experimenting with, you know, writing with a character was like this four eye, four eye concept. Yeah. yeah. They don't know that. So you get this situation where you hit me, you have to, sometimes you have to like explain yourself in workshop by cultural lens you know but when it comes to like the mechanics of your story like all of the things plot point of view um characterization all those things you really nail it but when it comes to like cultural lens it, it's not really easy for them to get it because you know it's it's not what they know so the cultural aspect of it and then um yeah uh, that's one thing and then you know just 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 
just navigating the space and the MFA um, in class with um, so many domestic students, American students, you need to, in America, there's this aspect of sugar coating. It's always mm. like, you have to be like nice and stuff. So, so subtle. How you, yeah, you have to be subtle. So how do you navigate that when you, like, from, you come from a place where Africans, we're, we're, all Africans. Nice. we're just direct. <laughs> We just see that that's in black eh? that's in all white that's in black okay. especially i think it, especially when it comes to giving negative feedback i think africans don't have a good time of you know i don't actually I, i'm even i'm not sure this could be whole conversation we'll probably talk about it, but, but yeah, i think it's even in reverse i feel like it's easier for americans to tell because the way i've had from you know, my supervisors at work and other feedback they actually give you directly compared to other situations but i, I guess it's, it, it it differs so yeah but um Richard, yeah, so to find out from you. Yeah, just, just to conclude my, my my thought on workshop. So what I do is I have a good sieve. I have a good sieve. So I'm in a workshop. Um, um, but I'm open. I have an open process. Like even when I write stories, I send to people. I send to my friends. It's like, what do you think about this? I send. So I have a good sieve when I think, and I think I've worked with editors before, like Af Afri uh, African editors in the continent. And I remember working with an uh, editor from South Africa. Um, called, when when my story was long listed for like for the SSDA competition, um, Helen Moffat, she said, you know, she told me, like, it was like a compliment to me at times. She's like, you really get the editing process, what and all. I was like, ah, it's coming from like a dog <laughs> from Africa. I was like, wow, this is this is like a compliment. So I sort of, I, I my instincts for editing are like, like really on point. Like even when I was way back in Cameroon, if from the moment you start saying something in workshop or in your written comments, if it's, if it's going to be helpful for me, before you even end, I already know where you're going and I'm going to take it. I'm like, wow, great, great point. I'm going to take this. Sometimes when I see it and I was like, um, I'll modify this one. And if I see, once I start reading your comment, which is not going to go into my story, and once you, before you even get to the third sentence, I'm like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'm not taking this I'm not taking. to yourself. <laughs> so uh, my three are like, accept, modify, reject. And, um, I'm more reject mode, more reject mode because I, yeah, I have my my artistic identity which I don't want to like dissolve. I don't want to like um compromise. Just because um, of it. I know so, that also well when you hear all these kind of comments. I mean, for me, it's it's really affected me a lot to hear feedback and then start wondering like what I, what was I even trying to say in the beginning? Now I've lost it and I'm just in this weird space. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I know how to like really um I, I you know. Well, like with feedback and stuff. Yeah. So what's what's next for you, Ketcha? What's what are you working on? What should we be expecting from you? What are you looking forward to in the future now? Oh, in the future. Well, for the near future, mm -hmm. for the near future, watch out for I've got a piece, I've got a um well it's it's a music review, but it's style it's styled like an AC. So I wrote I wrote about the music, um the music in the Lion King. I, oh, I, I, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um. For any for the viewers who don't know, I'm also an occasional music journalist. I've written about Makosa before and and the after. Yeah. Moment. I saw a lot of that in your story about uh, America. Yeah. 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 And, yeah and, and even when and even when I write like like short stories, there's always a reference to music. I'm a music journalist, and I've written music pieces for. I've written um. I've written music articles for Bakwa magazine about three or four. Um. For different Nigerian blogs. Um, oh, when Manu Bango died, I wrote one for, uh, I wrote an obituary essay for Manu Bango in the Lagos Review. And, and um, yeah, different, different things. Like, um, there was a Makosa article in the Africa Report. So um, I, I wrote a piece titled The Sound of the Lion King, The Sound of the Lion King, which analyzes um, the songs from the 94 soundtrack, the 2019 soundtrack, and then mm -hmm. And then the 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 Lion King, the key soundtrack, which Beyonce created. So it analyzes the album, three albums, and it uh, analyzes the intellectual property theft of the, the Lion King <laughs> by um, Solomon Pupoli, in the, the the great South African, uh, uh, the great late great, great South African singer. You know, yeah, and um, and then um, just just the history of the music, the history of the contribution by African musicians to the Lion King franchise. You know how they went from intellectual property theft to to right now using our very own Salatiel and 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 and, and um Whiskey and Beyonce's you know, and making um, black artists bound here the music that project and getting yeah so um, that that that's coming up on that will be published in the podcast review um 
on, on November 16th. That that's yeah. probably how yeah. school literary journal. And then um I'm working on a novel. Um yeah, I, I was working on, on, on I was working on an airport novel, but I put it I put it um I put it on hold. I haven't stopped. I put it on hold. Um because there's another novel bubbling in me, so I want to complete the new novel before I get back to the airport novel. The airport novel, it was a little tricky to write because it was I don't want to jump into that so much, but I'm working on a new novel, uh, which will be my main project for like the next year, for the next year. Um, I think it, 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 it what, it's, it's what's going to occupy me in the MFA for as long as you graduate of uh, the new novel I'm working on. Good. That's, that's amazing, man. And I, I wish you only the best. And there are two things I would like to find out. There's so many questions that I have, but with just you. Yeah, I mean, we can do another one another day. Yeah, really we do another special. one. Yeah, and I'm just. Yeah, if you have any any last words for anybody who's trying to get into it, there are actually two questions that I have. The first one is, yeah. have has your writing changed the way you see the world? And then two, any feedback, any words that you have for somebody who wants to join? So you can start with the first one, which is how has writing affected the way you observe the environment around you? Wow, that's a very pertinent question. I was writing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just makes me see the world clearer in a way um, than I saw before. Because the way I muse is I, I muse, I muse in my head, but when I muse on paper, like the thoughts form clearly. I'm able to like see things um, clearly. Also, I think feedback from the readers is important. Not so it's not just me. There is this great quote. Um, that someone called Alexander Chi says, I think it's Alexander Chi. Um, he said, when you write a story, it's it's just you. But when you submit it to workshop, you you get different possibilities, and of course, you get from crit from feedback and critique. You know, you get different possibilities. Like the the, the horizons of the story, it expands. Yeah. You know, yeah. now when when I write, so I don't think it's it's just me it's the way I see the world after the story. I think I see the world in a different light with feedback from readers. I'm not talking about positive feedback. I'm not talking about positive feedback. I'm talking about or even negative feedback. So the, yeah, the way people relate to the stories and the kind of personal things of the, the first on earth makes me see the world clearer mm -hmm. and and in another light. For example, um, this is my visa rejections essay, which just been published. Family members and friends um, started unblocking their visa rejection stories, which they had tucked away in some hidden corner of their lives, you know, and laid it out to me. So it made me see visa rejections in a different light, and the way they analyzed it. And also, I um, I published a, a short story in the Bakwa books called uh, Bad Lake. Um, I don't know if you read that. It's it's no, a Bakwa book, sure. yeah, of passion and ink. Um, it got Bad Lake. Um, a, a very young, uh, one of our young friends, um, Raisa, she's a young student, she attended the Bakwa Writers. So she she said something, and I've not really seen the story in that like, like, oh, that, but in the in the story, there's a part where there's a, there, in the lake, there, there's a, a reek, the reek drilling the gas at, uh, well, I don't want to explain, for some, someone doesn't know. A reek is story. <laughs> yeah, story, the story. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a reek, you know, that drills the gas from the bottom of the lake. And then there is this, you know, there is this spirit woman concept in the story. There's a spirit woman. And the scientists are like, nah, not, nothing like spirit woman exists. And at the end of the story, the, the spirit woman degasses the lake. And Raisa was like, it's really cool that what I enjoyed about that story the most is, is that um, science and, and the supernatural get to coexist. They don't fight, but they coexist. I was like, wow, that was like really profound. I wasn't thinking about it that way when I wrote it. And then, then I was reading uh, and I was reading an interview by Robert Spielman, who was the former editor of Tin House Books. He said, I'll write to read a speculative fiction story someday where an evil god is a detective in a in a in a murder case. And I was thinking about it like, wait a minute. People go to to people go to fortune tellers and and you know herbalists and stuff and you know soothsayers to 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 um 
find out, you know, okay, I want to find out who killed my mom, I want to find out who killed my dad, and stuff like that. You know, uh, like if there's a murder and you go and find out from the you, that that's like a detective. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I just thought about it. So so you see the way I think. I I you know, so I, I blended um the whole bandit thing where this this spirit woman in a lake, the gases a lake, which is a scientific process, but you, you can explain. And then an Igbo god who is a detective in a murder case, you know. So it, it made me so the way you see, I, I connect things and I see the world in a different light in ways that I haven't seen before, and I'm connecting dots. So sort of that that's sort of the way I see the world. Um, okay. Wow, I use my skills, read that feedback, and I connect to other things. I see the different light. That's a lot there that I would love to go into, but we'll probably talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Now. And uh, any, is there anything else that you would like to to share that I did not bring up? Something that you know is important for us to know of about your story at this point that I probably didn't ask. Something that you um, like to share of yours? Not really. I mean, we, I mean, Kamga, you're you're my you're my you're my bro. We we can always do this thing. Um, yeah, we can always do this thing another time. Um, definitely there's just any yeah, last words for somebody who's watching who's like getting inspired to join the writer's crew and it's like wow uh, my grandfather that I've seen like do you have any any words of wisdom for people who are watching who want to get into writing and possibly make it something that they'll do for the rest of your life because it's something that I know people want to do but it's always the idea of if you're a writer in Cameroon you're wasting your time but here you are somebody who is able to follow their passion and get somewhere where you're taking action towards making it come a reality so do you have anything to say to people who might want to get into that space um, it's a long road, but it can be done. That's what No Valuable Awayo once told me. I've always remembered that. It's a long road, but it can be done. There are going to be many rejections in the beginning. Just keep on, just keep, you know, just keep, just keep pushing, just keep submitting, just keep writing, develop a shock absorber for the rejections, just keep submitting ruthlessly every place, every workshop, every magazine, every festival, just keep trying, um, all of these people who have succeeded before, they all went through rejections. I mean, J.K. Rowling had had 13 rejections for the first Harry Potter book. It's like everywhere, everybody knows that story. I mean, all of these other guys, all these, uh, Dan Brown, all these, Stephen King, everybody else, Chimamanda. Chimamanda had 25 rejections for the manuscript <laughs> of Popo High because, yeah, for the book, yeah. So every, every, yeah, everybody's gone through rejections. Just keep writing, just keep writing and improving your craft and, um, Keep submitting. Just keep, just keep at it. Um, don't focus. Just write, submit. Forget about it. Just keep doing the work, and um, <laughs> one day it will definitely happen. Yeah. Well, Kesha, let me go through the comment section here. We had uh, Mark who was there the first minute, and then and Lara says, "My hair is cute." Well, thank you. Uh, we had Mark who says he was talking, I think here he was talking about when you were, you were in the beginning when you talk about, you know, working at the airport, at the airport you know, everybody's in the same boat. So there's that feeling of, well, we're all together in this. Yeah. Okay. Place. I get it. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to talk yeah. to people at airports, especially in yep. African airports. Yep. Yep. So yeah. GXNE cross. Well, yo, back at you. I'm a moment. I'm, Amos, Amos is in Canada. I know he loves to write. I think, you no, know, you, I want to say you might know him because all of us went to UB, but UB has been a place where I met a bunch of people. I met Amos in UB. And yeah, this is, yeah. okay, I'm going to share the link for the read for people to read. And this is uh, Femia Naomi. Hello. Thank you so much Hello. for joining me. And Eddie, Eddie was here. Eddie says, Culture Shock, Monique, what should try to warn about this? <laughs> yeah, Monique, Monique might warn me about it. <laughs> Yeah, Hello, I mean, Monique. Monique, Monique, yeah. So, Gitche, thank you so much for being here, and thanks, guys, for hopping in and watching us talk about books for one hour thirty minutes. You know, it's a lot. I really appreciate your time, and I know that it's something that is very valuable. So, thank you for being here. Just, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do subscribe because there'll be more interviews like this, more conversation with Gitche to talk about a lot of these things. And I'm still mispronouncing your name. Say Gitche. Gitche Atemken. Gitche Atemken. Atemken. That's a Bangwa version. Uh, oh. Kamga, thank you very much for for inviting me. Um, it, it was really um, a pleasure doing this. Um, I really feel energized. Um, thank you, and keep doing what you keep doing what you do best. Keep creating content. Um, you're an amazing um, YouTuber. You're an amazing journalist, and was, this was very insightful. And keep doing you, bro. Um, thank you. Man. Watch it. <laughs>
Thank you very much. No shaking. No shaking. No shaking. No shaking. All right, guys. Ending the live right now. Bye, guys. Bye.